Hi, welcome to the sixth video in this video series on the ethical implications of emerging virtual and augmented reality technologies. In this video, I'm gonna be talking about work and the ethical implications that VR and AR present in this domain of our lives. Now, AR promises a lot of utility as an assistive technology within the workplace, particularly within the manufacturing industries, where the hands-free visual heads-up display has a lot of really clear um, uses in environments like warehouses or the factory floor, where people are responsible for device assembly. But along with these, there are some really, really serious ethical issues with their use in this context. There's a body of research in human-computer interaction that presents a lot of experimental cases, with a one or two of these having made the leap from lab to industry. As Marcus Funk and colleagues point out, augmented reality interfaces have been used in some capacity since the early 1990s, specifically in aerospace engineering. A range of research to date has addressed the promising potential of AR in manual assembly work, underlining its benefits in reducing error and cognitive load in both abled and disabled workers and providing task relevant information. But little work has been done on the long-term evaluation of in situ projection, with the exception of Funk's 2017 study, which provided an account of in situ AR devices um, in manual assembly workplace, finding that such interfaces hindered the assembly speed of expert workers because it increased the cognitive load because they had to pay attention to two things at once but it did enhance the efficiency of untrained workers. Beyond experimental applications emerging from human-computer interaction research, technology companies have variously come to develop augmented reality applications for the workplace. A range of AR hardware from Google Glass Enterprise Edition, and the Vuzik M400, and software like Upskill have emerged for use within workplace settings. As the Google Glass Enterprise Edition website notes, the device is used within context of manufacturing, but also in logistics and healthcare. And we see this in example, through examples like Boeing's use of Google Glass. Zero, five, five, zero. We realized we had voice command. And that was huge. Now you have two hands on the product the whole time. You don't have to take anything off. Once you put them on, you'll say skylight. It'll show you on the diagram, and then you'll take the wire and you'll just pop it in fast as heck. You know, there's video streaming. If you have an issue, they can see it from their laptop or wherever because you're streaming it through your glasses. Then you can store In their testimonial for the Google Glass, Boeing frame AR as appending the limited capacities of the human worker, specifically those installing electrical wiring on aircraft by offering real-time, hands-free, interactive 3D wiring diagrams right before your eyes. Yet, despite big companies take, staking out a space in, in industrial settings, we've identified no research that looks at the implications of augmented reality in the workplace, nor any that provides an account of the scale at which this technology is already being used. As such, in order to think speculatively about how what the, or what the uh, ethical implications are for augmented and virtual reality in the workplace. Um, in this video, I'm looking much more broadly at augmented reality to include things like wearable sensor technologies like Fitbits. Instead of square, focusing squarely on head-mounted augmented reality, this wider literature that we can then engage with shows the clear potentials for augmented reality's impact in the workplace. We believe that many of these current issues are pertinent in consideration of AR's future. Wearable devices that track user activity are a key part of the contemporary workplace. As Moore suggests, this includes wearables as efficiency tracking mechanisms for manual work in warehouses, corporate wellness programs in white collar or office contexts, or the GPS tracking of delivery trucks. Such technologies are widely problematized following news of Amazon's use of tracking wearables for employees in warehouses, specifically a wristband, which gave it the ability to track and record employees' hands in real time. Workers in Amazon's so-called fulfillment centers, the sites for storage and the delivery of and packaging of goods for customers have widely reported conditions of surveillance and strict control as a result of these monitoring devices. 
In an Australian context, Buren reported that warehouse workers are expected to work at Amazon pace, somewhere between walking and jogging. She notes in that article that workers, many of whom are precarious casual workers hired by Amazon through labor hire agencies, are at risk of losing further employment should they not meet this standard. To get an idea of what this is like, you should check out the amazing Amazon race news game that the ABC developed around its reportage of what the working conditions are like inside an Amazon warehouse in Australia and how the quantification of our behavior at work really leads to a, a, a reduction in empathy, caring for others and social experience. It's really dehumanizing. A range of work has developed critical responses to this movement towards tracking and quantification in the workplace. From the perspective of sociology and critical theory, Christopher Till suggests that the deployment of smart tech in corporate workplaces and the veneer of corporate wellness that they carry with them work as a mechanism for control. Drawing from French philosopher Bernard Stiegler, Till argues that we might think of corporate tracking as a mechanism for shaping people's psychic and libidinal energy, accruing benefits to companies, rather than being for the stated material health outcomes of corporate wellness programs. Critics elsewhere, have, critics elsewhere have compared quantified work to Taylorism, that is, an approach to applying experimental measures to enhance managerial control of worker efficiency, or as Phoebe Moore argues in Body and Society paper, an updated form of Taylorism. She writes, on the effects of such regimes of quantification and tracking in the workplace, we can speak of declining welfare for workers and the associated regime of total mobilization and surveillance as they corrode workers' health and safety and create anxiety, burnout, and overwork. Moreover, she notes, capital is tempted to invest in new technology, not because it may improve the public good, regardless of the rhetoric of wellness that accompanies the introduction of these technologies, but because it can increase profit ratios. Offering a different take, O'Neill suggests that quantified work resembles a distinct style of worker management referred to as European science of work. The distinction, O'Neill argues, is that the wearables and sensors mobilized in quantified workplaces do not simply attempt to intensify the body as to be more productive, but rather manipulate the production processes as to better accommodate biological processes of fatigue and regeneration, that is, better harnessing productivity through attention to the laboring body's rhythms. Despite the growing prevalence of head-mounted augmented reality hardware and software, research on that we, we identified no existing research on this topic. Yet we believe that there's a clear potential for many of the same issues described in existing research on the quantification and rationalization of work through wearable sensor technology to be played out through the introduction of augmented reality into workplace settings. Notably, as we see from the experimental HCI work, work that I surveyed earlier in the video, as well as examples of augmented realities, rhetorical flaming in the workplace, such as Boeing's testimonial for Google Glass, there's a similar emphasis on making the user a more productive subject in ways that ultimately reduce and dehumanize the expertise of the human worker. In the context of virtual reality, the issues around work include the use of virtual reality learning analytics that were discussed in the third lecture on surveillance and platform power but also the way that virtual reality may become a site of labor that is also quantified and rationalized in the same way. But also a subject to the casualization of work that we see in gig economy companies like Uber and Airtasker. In this video, we can see a demonstration of Japanese company Tele Existence VR remote work robot in their collaboration with grocery store Family Mart. Designing an autonomous robot to stack shelves is an extremely difficult thing. And we can see the clear benefits to industry of using a remote worker to control this robot in VR. The same worker could stock shelves in one store and then immediately remote into another robot in a different store 200 kilometers away without the need for travel. But what we know from the introduction of other smart sensing technologies in the workplace is that technologies like these will similarly impact workers in negative ways to the benefit of those that own the stores and own the robot. Analytics applied to the data collected about the worker will be used to intensify the body to be more productive, leading to declining welfare, high stress, and anxiety. Disconnecting the worker from the community may socially isolate them, 
we might also expect the data collected from this robotic system to be utilized to train future fully autonomous, ro autonomous robots, putting this displaced worker out of work entirely. For another great critical game that predicts this ultra dynamic labor market, check out Molly Industria's 2003 game, TurboFlex. In TurboFlex, he, he wrote in 2003, the need for a flexible labor has grown exponentially since the beginning of the century. Today, the productions and bureaucracy of traditional staffing solutions aren't sustainable anymore. A single worker may be needed by different companies over the course of the same day. That's why TuboFlex, Incorporated, the world's leading human resource services company, created a complex system of tubes that allow us to allocate employees in real time according to the market's demand. Playing the role of a TuboFlex employee, you have to survive this ultra-dynamic labor market, getting quickly used to the most disparate tasks. Welcome to the Tube Age. VR might make this Tube Age and its comparative dehumanization possible. One minute you may be stocking shelves in a supermarket in Tokyo, the next instructing a robot to flip burgers in a McDonald's in Texas, whatever the market demands. Thanks for checking out this sixth video in the series. Don't forget to take a look at the full ethical implications of emerging mixed reality technologies report, link in the video description below, which has many further details and references for many of the things that I talk about in this video. If you've got any questions, please post them below and don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a great day.